this on your YouTube, Dean, after they're recorded? Yes. Yeah, so okay, I'm still hanging the one that we're zooming. Good. I want to point people to that, too. Okay. All right. Let's um, begin with a quick kind of summary of where we've been. Um, so if we look at, let me put this up as a full screen. If we kind of review where we've been, just to get the scope, because we're finishing off an interlude today. Um, our first chapter uh, is John's vision, where he sees uh, the risen Christ. He gets his uh, angel uh, guide who's going to show him around, and he gets this picture of what will um, come to pass. And then those next um, two chapters, chapters two, two and three, are our church, uh, letters to the churches. So you have these seven churches in Asia Minor, which are currently Turkey, uh, which were some of the most significant, really a central um, area for the church in that day. And so these were letters to some key churches uh, about the struggles they were in, about the, the problems they were having, about dissension. Uh, and we talked about one of the biggest threats, and we're going to loop back to this today, the, the emperor cult. Uh, which was threatening their lives. If they did not uh, pay homage to Caesar uh, with their taxes and worship at the emperor, uh, um, at the temples for the, for the emperor, uh, they were being executed. So that's uh, in the midst of their crisis. And then we come to chapters four and five, which even though it's at the beginning is really like the fulcrum or like the central uh, picture of the book because there we leave earth, we come to heaven, and we see what's going on in the heavenly realm. And we see God on a throne, God in control, and a God who is being worshiped continually. And that his son is there, who is the lion, who is also the lamb that's been slain. Uh, and that they're about to show us what is about to take place. There's no threat. There's no chaos. There's no worry. It's as if everything is as it has always been planned. Uh, and so the first thing that happens is we're going to get these series of seven judgments, which we said are kind of like parallel to each other. They're really um, three versions of the same picture of God's judgment as the world wraps up. So it's this day of Yahweh or the day of the Lord, like the Old Testament always talks about. Uh, we're just getting a picture of the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, which will begin with judgment, but again, will end in God's total restoration of all things. So the first seven is the seven seals, and we looked at that and how a quarter of everything gets destroyed. Uh, and then it ends. Um, then we get the picture of seven trumpets right after it. And uh, then all the destruction seems to ramp itself up to a third. So it's, it's almost like the crescendoing of woe uh, as it builds. And then what we looked at last time is an interlude be before we hit our last set of seven. So we get this vision of the woman and the dragon. And the woman um, is people have done a lot with this is on one level, she's like a, 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 an Eve type. Um, some have looked at her as Israel. Some have said she's Mary. Uh, but the key is that this woman is seen as the one um, who represents people of God and who brings forth the Christ. And in doing that, we have the dragon who is the serpent, the enemy, and then it identifies the dragon as Satan um, is wanting to devour her child. Um, then we get another kind of view where all of a sudden it's like the picture of the dragon being battled in heaven uh, by Michael and the angels and that the dragon and his minions are thrown down the earth. And then we're told that they make war on the offspring of the woman because she's protected. And so it basically sets us up to say, hey, Things are going to be kind of tough for you as humans because the dragon is down there wreaking havoc as he will. But in the end, we get that picture. Remember where the flood is coming out of the dragon's mouth, but the earth swallows it up to protect us. So it's this picture that even in the midst of all this chaos, um, God is at work. Even the world itself, the earth itself, God uses to 
thwart the dragon. But it says, beware, because there is a foe and there is danger. Um, then the really key chapter that's going to be built off of today is in chapter 13, where it says the dragon stands uh, by the sea. And keep that sea image in mind, because we said the sea is often chaos uh, in ancient mythology. Uh, we see that in ancient Mesopotamia. We see it in the Bible with uh, Leviathan, um, uh, Rahav, the, the sea monster. We see that as a typical foe um, in the ancient cosmos. Um, here, this dragon stands on the sea, and out of the sea comes a beast. And the beast uh, has the seven heads and ten crowns. Um, and it pictures this one now as... This is our Antichrist. He's the, he's like the bizarro world Jesus. He is the one uh, who was wounded mortally in the head, uh, but then would come back. This is the picture of the beast. So he's coming back. And then we get the beast number two, who is kind of like an image of the Holy Spirit, who's like the mouthpiece. And so it's kind of like God's Trinity, right, is up against this like anti-Trinity of the dragon, beast number one, beast number two, okay? So this, this is what was going on when we left uh, last week. And it said, anyone who is going to live in this new order of the beast uh, needed to receive a mark on their head or their hand in order to buy things. And that is parallel to the picture we had earlier that it said God's redeemed would have his name uh, marked on their heads. Um, and so it's kind of like you have, the, the, I mean, as, as campy as it might sound, it's like you have God's team and his people, and you have this dragon's team and his people. Uh, and so that's where we left um, last week. So here's what we're going to look at today. Chapter 14, and I was going to say, okay, well, let, let's look at our team. And we're going to hear about the 144,000. Um, then we're going to get this picture of the last seven, uh, who, uh, which are the seven bowls poured out. And we're going to hear some very common uh, uh, familiar imagery in that picture of the bowls. And then we'll look at chapter 17, which is the culmination of the beast and the one that gets called the great whore. And we'll talk about this because this is like a new character who's on the beast. And what we'll see today is that there is this interesting thing that Revelation does a lot, where something, where symbols have multi-meanings, right? We're kind of used to symbol codes when we read stories and there's a symbol, uh, something symbolic, that it's just that thing over and over. But in Revelation, sometimes a thing, uh, a symbol has multiple interpretations. So we'll look at that, all right? So that's where we're going today. So let's um, pick up with the text, and I'm going to read in chapter 14. Um, here we go. All right, can everyone see that? Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. so here we go. Then I looked, now remember, we just saw the, the, the dragon beast one and beast two. Then I looked and there was the lamb standing on Mount Zion. So you have a dragon standing on the sea and then you have the lamb standing on Mount Zion, which again is the holy mountain in Jerusalem. And with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. These follow the lamb wherever he goes. They have been redeemed from humankind as first fruits for God and the lamb. And in their mouths, no lie was found. They were blameless. Let me just take this piece real quickly. You have these two like facing off for battle, right? 144,000. We talked about this before when this number came up earlier. Uh, 12 in this book and in other places is the number for God's people, right? You have 12 tribes of Israel. You have 12 uh, disciples or apostles. Uh, here you have 12 times 12 and thousand is typically 
uh, the number for uh, a whole lot, right? So it's like 12 times 12 times 1,000 is 144,000. Last time when it used this specific number, it then followed up in the next picture of this group of people and just called them innumerable from every nation, tongue, and tribe. But here it's back to our nice neat 144,000. Uh, again, which if you, if you um, know any Jehovah's Witnesses, that's a big number. Because in, in the Jehovah's Witness faith, they believe that there will be only 144,000 people um, who are saved by God. Uh, and they tend to be who Jehovah's Witnesses. But anyway, um, so there's this group. And when it describes them, again, let's think symbolically. that We're not talking about literal people who all are virgins um, who have never lied, right? Somebody could read this, take it literally, and thought, wow, you know, they're out of luck here. Um, we're going to get this when we get the language of the great whore of Babylon, is being unfaithful to God um, is often portrayed as, uh, uh, that kind of idolatry is often per, uh, portrayed as like adultery because it's seen as one is in a, like a marriage covenant God with his people. And so that language of um, sexual immorality is often tied to idolatry. And so this fact that these people are, are pure, they're all virgins. Um, remember, they're going against the beast who is called the deceiver. These people never lie. They're blameless. They're the first fruits um, of the lamb. So this is this picture we have of this, this group of people. All right. And then from there, we start to get the woes again. Ready? Then I saw another angel flying in mid heaven with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. See here, we've just, again, we've said, who is this? It's everybody. And he said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Then another angel, a second followed saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So here's this sexual imagery we're getting. Then another angel, a third followed them, crying with a loud voice. Those who worship the beast and its image and receive a mark on their foreheads or on their hands, they will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured unmixed into the cup of his anger. And they will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image and for anyone who receives the mark of its name. A couple things here. It's referring to Babylon, but we're going to find out real quickly. It isn't really Babylon. Babylon is code for the evil bad guys out of which idolatry comes. But when you look at this passage here, and this idea of drinking the wine of God's wrath, this wine and grape treading imagery is going to be um, repeated. But then this idea that they're tormented in fire and sulfur. But this language of, their, of their, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. That language of smoke going up forever and ever is typically the language of offerings made to Yahweh, to God. Like we hear about the temple and we hear about uh, you know, these pictures of worship from God's altar, like the smoke, the incense, it goes up eternally. But here it like turns it on its head because it's like, yeah, these people are going to get theirs. They're going to be, you know, burning in the pit and their smoke of torment goes up day and night with no rest. So it's like, ooh, that's, that's, a, that's a dark twist for a gloomy Sunday morning. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, for those who keep the commandments of God and hold fast to the wrath of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who from now on die in the Lord. Yes, says the spirit, they will rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. Now, again, this, this sounds dark, right? It's like blessed are the ones who are dying now, but there is this strain that goes through this book that continually says, blessed are those who endure, right? And keep their faith to the end, even in the face of martyrdom, 
right? This was no easy prosperity gospel that says, but if you get on Jesus team, everything turns out <laughs> perfectly, right? Because these people are still dying. And in the midst of this, the author is giving them encouragement and comfort and saying, hey, you're blessed if you die during this period in the Lord, okay? That doesn't, that doesn't preach well in 21st century America. Um, so here's, here becomes the harvest language. And again, you will hear here and later um, backdrop for our um, battle hymn of the Republic. When I, then I looked and there was a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like the son of man with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to the one who sat on the cloud. Use your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So the one who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Then another angel came out from the altar, the angel who had authority over fire, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, use your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth and gathered the vintage of the earth, and he threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the wine press as high as a horse's bridle for a distance of about 200 miles. All right, a couple things about that. Um, when, when we get this image of wine in the Bible, it is two totally um, opposite symbols. On the one hand, wine is often a symbol for like joy and happiness, right? Like we celebrate with wine and this is a, a picture of things positive, but it can also be basically a symbol of wrath and judgment because, uh, you know, if you get that wine stain on the front of your shirt, it can look like somebody was bleeding, right? So it's got this blood imagery. And again, this is our, this is our grapes of wrath language, right? That, that it's, it's God's judgment as he's treading, you know, in the wine press. And as you're like stomping these grapes and all this, you know, in this image, the blood comes out, right? Now, you have a couple um, in the fall of Jerusalem in 70, and then again in, in um, the Crusades. You have this language of the streets of Jerusalem running with blood. And there is this line, again, it's got to be hyperbole, but there's this line during the Crusades about the blood was up to the bridles of the horses, as they went through the streets, so many people had been slaughtered. Like this image here, and again, maybe the, maybe the people talking about that in the Crusades are making reference to this passage. But it's this idea, it, you know, there are other places in Scripture where the idea of God's harvest, right? In the Gospels, the harvest is plentiful and he's looking for workers. That's like a really happy image, right? Like bringing in the sheaves as the old good hymn goes. This is different from that. This is trampling out God's judgment, okay? Any questions so far? Anybody tracking? Mm -hmm. All right, let me go back. Um, so this one again, like everything is over the top in the book of Revelation. Here, the blood's to a horse's bridle, but for a distance of about 200 miles. Now for the medical people, if you did the math on how much, how many humans it would take to fill up a 200 uh, <laughs> mile area, that's one heck of a slaughter, but that's what was coming, okay? So let's move on to 15. And with this, so again, we just kind of got a summary of God's about to wreak havoc, um, but now we're gonna get the picture of it laid out in our last set of seven. So chapter 15. Then I saw another portent in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is ended. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mixed with fire, 
and those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands, right? We'd heard the, we'd heard the harps earlier and we'd seen the sea of glass, but not mixed with fire. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and amazing are your deeds, Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations, Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name. For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your judgments have been revealed. All right, now notice Song of Moses. We're connected to the, the splitting of the sea. God's deliverance of his people. But again, get ready for all of the Exodus imagery in these judgments. After this, I looked, and the temple of the tent of witnesses in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues, robed in pure bright linen, with golden sashes across their chests. Then one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls, full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were ended. All right, so here we have a temple and a tabernacle in heaven. Because, of course, if you have one on earth, you've got to have, according to Hebrews, right, the ultimate one is in heaven. Um, and they're, they're coming out, these angels are coming out of God's temple, which is full of smoke which is, again, from the offerings, but also from, like, the presence of God. That's the picture we always got with the tabernacle and with the temple, that there was this smoky presence. And, again, we're about to, like, unleash it for the last time, but notice everyone is still worshiping God. There's a central theme of worship that worked itself through this book. Despite everything going on, people are doing their right duty, and that's worshiping. All right, chapter 16. This gets kind of redundant because it's our third picture of the sets of judgments. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, go and pour out the earth on the earth, the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured his bowl on the earth and a foul and painful sore came on those who had the mark of the beast and who worshiped its image. Again, Remember that there you have the boils and sores that come as one of the plagues uh, during the Exodus. The second angel poured his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing in the sea died. Again, we don't have to even repeat how obvious that one is. The third angel poured his bowl into the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water say, You are just, O holy one who are and were, for you have judged these things because they shed the blood of saints and prophets. You have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve, right? Here we have this like poetic justice. You took the prophet's blood? Well, here's what we're going to do to you. It's interesting because that same kind of poetic justice language is in the Exodus. When, when God kills the firstborn, there is this line about, how Israel was God's firstborn, and you enslaved and killed my people, here's what happens to you. And then I heard the altar respond, yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, your judgments are true and just. The fourth angel poured his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. That one's new. They were scorched by the fierce heat, but they cursed the name of God, who had authority over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Again, it's showing us a picture of what kind of people we're talking about, right? Even in the midst of punishment, they're going to keep cursing God. The fifth angel poured his bowl on the throne of the uh, on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. Again, that's the that's the second last plague, right? People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because their pains and sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up in order to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And then I saw three foul spirits like frogs coming from the mouth of the dragon and the mouth of the beast and from the mouth of the false prophet. These are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle, the great day 
of God the Almighty. See, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake in his clothes, not going about naked and exposed to shame. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Harmageddon. Let me just pause here. One, the picture of um, the frogs coming out of the mouth, right? Again, famous plague, except it's like they're like frogs. They're really demonic spirits. And these demonic spirits are rousing up kings from the east, which is where Israel's tormentors always come from. And they are coming from the east to what in Hebrew is called Harmageddon, which is the Hebrew Har Megiddo, the mountain of Megiddo. Now, Megiddo was a town that was on an important plain where all the big battles of the Bible go down. It's the way northern enemies, which were really eastern enemies because they're coming um, through the Fertile Crescent, the way they're descending down on Israel. Uh, for those who went to Israel, we went up on Megiddo. It seems like a mountain now because there's 21 layers to the city, destroyed so many times. It was a key strategic place. There were battles there from the time of the Canaanites before Israel was even a nation against the Egyptians, all the way uh, during the Ottoman Empire with the British. So they say, hey, if there's going to be a battle, the mother of all battles, that's where it's going to go down. So everybody's gathering there. The seventh angel poured his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple. And here's our imagery again from the throne saying, it is done. And there came flashes of lightning, rumbles, peals of thunder, and a violent earthquake such as had not occurred since people were on the earth. So violent was that earthquake. But that's not all. It's going to build because this is the final picture of it. The great city was split into three parts. The cities of the nations fell. God remembered great Babylon and gave her the wine cup of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away and no mountains were to be found. And the huge hailstones, each weighing about 100 pounds, dropped from heaven on people until they cursed God for the plagues of the hail. So fearful was that plague. Again, there's hail in the plagues of Egypt, but here we got 100 pound ones, right? Everything's bigger and better in Revelation. <laughs> but notice our final picture. It starts, we hear around the throne of God, the thunder, the lightning, the peals of thunder and the earthquake. We didn't get the earthquake in heaven, but then each of the end of the seven has this, except with this one, the final one, we get the, it is done. So it's seen as like, this is the epitome of God finishing his judgment. And now we're going to shift. And we shift to the great whore of Babylon, who had just said he made her drink from the cup of his wrath. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great whore who is seated on many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and with the wine of whose fornication the inhabitants of the earth have become drunk. So he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a cup full of abominations and impurities of her fornication. And on her forehead was written a name, a mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of whores and of the earth's abominations. And I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the witnesses to Jesus. Okay, a couple things real quickly. She's dressed royally with some of these things. But at the same time, this picture of she has a name on, on um, her forehead. It is a, a that was a practice of uh, prostitutes. Uh, in the brothels uh, in ancient Rome, that they would have their names on their heads, okay? And she's called Babylon the Great. Now, we're going to see in a second, um, Babylon is just an image here because Babylon was always seen as the enemy of God's people because of the destruction of Jerusalem in the exile. 
um, Babylon was seen as the place of idolatry. Um, Israel, even though it was so far away, Israel was, um, ancient Judah rather, Israel and Judah were, were following some of the Mesopotamian worship practices, um, even in the temple. And again, this woman um, and her power uh, was drinking the blood of the saints, right? So she's a, she's a persecutor. So let's keep going. When I saw her, I was greatly amazed. This is John speaking, right? Like, which is really an interesting thing. But the angel said to me, why are you so amazed? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carried her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to ascend from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. Now notice, that's a, that's a play off the language of Jesus, right? Who was and is and is to come. But the beast was is not and is about to ascend from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. This is this whole Nero redivivus cult, this idea that Nero was so horrible that he died, but he was coming back. And the inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life with the foundation of the world, will be amazed when they see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. Now notice, these people whose names aren't in the book of life, they're amazed by this beast, which is really interesting because this paragraph begins with John being amazed and the angel's like, wait, wait, why are you being amazed? This calls for a mind that has wisdom. Every time they say that, it's like, hey, I'm going to give you a, you know, a clue in our symbol code. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Okay. This is the clearest picture in the book that says we are talking not about Babylon. Babylon is code for Rome. Rome, who was violent, who was full of idolatry for the Christians and the Jews, and who slaughtered um, in its persecutions the early church. This woman, the whore of Babylon, is really the emperors of Rome. And the beast is the kingdom of Rome. But then the, then the symbol code switches. And here's, the, here's one of the most debated, tricky passages. And I'm going to give you one kind of common interpretation, but you have views all over the place on this. So at first it says these seven heads are the mountains on which she's seated. So it's saying, hint, this is Rome. But then it says, also, they are seven kings of whom five have fallen. One is living and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received the kingdom, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, together with the beast. These are united in yielding their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. All right, let me, let me try to give a summary of this other view of the seven kings. So as you can imagine, this has been like a key for so many people who especially see this as futuristic as they try to say, oh, these represent different kingdoms of the earth, and they count major empires, and they say, when we get to a seventh and then an eighth, and someone's like, oh, well, eighth is Britain, or no, it was America, or it was, and others take them as living leaders, and this is where people are naming Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan, and, and depending on at what point, if you're reading in the Cold War, who it's going to be versus others, some say this 10-headed beast is the European Union who has taken the place of taken the place of Rome as like the new Rome and it was dead and now it's come back, right? You can see how convenient that one is, except when the EU went past 10 nations and they had like 12 and was looking at 13 and said, no, but those late ones don't count because in ancient Rome, those are in the sand. So anyway, there's all kinds of things going on. I think there's something a little bit more straightforward and simple. Let me give this picture to you. The problem of the king. So it says there are five um, you know, who were already. 
if you look at the first five Caesars, you have Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero. So most scholars would say, if you're looking at something that the people of that day would, would be referencing, those are the five who have been. Now, if you're a Roman historian and you're going to quibble on the details, here's the caveat to this interpretation. After Nero's um, downfall, things went into a little bit of chaos in Rome, and you had Galba, Otho, and Vitalius in three years. I mean, two years. In two years, you had three emperors. So no one often refers to them as actual emperors. They were all vying, but never really established power. So in this, in this schema, they're not counted. So these are the five who have been. The one who is, that it refers to, is Vespasian, okay? Then it says, the one to come for a short time, that would be Titus. Titus rules for two years, okay? And then the eighth who was the seventh, like the seventh or with the seventh, the one who was not, who was and is not, this is Domitian. And Domitian was referred to even in his day. One of the ancient writers, uh, Juvenal, referred to him as the bald Nero. Because in many ways, people saw him and his campaign, even though for a short time against Christians and others, this was like a madman. He was, he was, he had all kinds of issues. And he was a conspiracy theorist and he was killing people in his court. And uh, he, ramped up the emperor cult, uh, began killing Christians. And so this Roman mindset of the, the, this view that Nero, who had died, had been fatally wounded, would return and wreak havoc on the earth, some saw in this Domitian. We said at the beginning, we think that, that John is writing this during the time of Domitian, and so in, in many ways, this theory makes sense of it all. The problem is when you read it as he describes it, it's as if John is writing it during the time of Vespasian. He's, saying he's the one who is, but here's who's going to come, and then who's going to ultimately come. Well, one level of, that I said at the beginning of apocalyptic literature is it's often set in a point where it sees itself as in the past and then is projecting out to the future. So to say that John artificially plants himself during the reign of Vespasian to make it look like, hey, here's some insider view of what's about to happen that people would be like, oh my gosh, that already happened, right? Would, would kind of fit the genre. So this is one view that explains this whole who was, who's to come, and who was not, uh, was and is not. This pictures Domitian as Nero resurrected which again, if this is the Antichrist, he's one who dies and comes back. So the question is, what about the 10 kings? In this view, they say the 10 kings are the Parthian kings um, who would come from the east and in the end wreak havoc uh, when they turn on Rome. So some people see this fitting altogether pretty nicely. Um, let's jump back to the text, though. How are we on time? We've got a couple minutes left. So after this picture, he says, and he said to me, the waters that you saw where the whore is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. Right? Like this, and it's interesting because it says she's seated on waters. That fits the original view of Babylon, which was referred to as the city on the waters, because you had Tigris, Euphrates, and then all these canal networks everywhere. Well, that symbol breaks down when you look at Rome, which is not seated on all kinds of waters, but he reinterprets for us. The water that you saw, where the whore is seated, are peoples, multitudes, and nations, and languages. It's saying, look, you saw the whole Roman Empire of all the different kinds of peoples that they control. And the 10 horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the whore. They will make her desolate and naked. They will devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by agreeing to give their kingdom to the beast. 
until the words of God will be fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Okay, so he kind of wraps it up for us right there and says, this, this, is, this is, again, go back to chapter 14. The kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. This is the picture of chapter 17. This is the understanding of who this whore of Babylon is. This is the picture. And again, in their minds, in their day, this was the ultimate enemy that represents all that's wrong in the world. But the picture is, in the end, God defeats that enemy. God defeats that persecutor. And the idolatry and the rebellion is wiped out. So next week, when we pick up with 18, 18 is basically a song of celebration of the fall of Babylon. It's kind of like the book of Nahum is like this song of, you know, destruction about Assyria as something Israel would rejoice over. Uh, The Christians will rejoice when they talk about the fall of Babylon. All right. Questions. That's a lot of stuff, but I, I hope it, it seemed like a good logical unit to, if we could get through it. So questions though. No. So, so here's where we're going to head. We'll, we'll probably have, we'll probably have another two weeks of finishing out the text of revelation but then I want to do something that Lutherans don't do much, <laughs> at least in my experience. I'm sure they do in some places. You have some uh, uh, people doing eschatology, but other traditions pay a whole lot more attention to reading scripture to say, hey, how is the world going to end? Luther kind of just took a God wins, it wraps up, and we won't worry about anything else. But there's a whole, whole series of viewpoints out there that sell whole series of books and movies that are really bad. I haven't read the books. I just saw a movie and it was like horrifying, but it's keeping, <laughs> it's keeping Kurt Cameron working. So, you know, mm-hmm. um, hey, I got a question. Yes. Um, I'm trying to figure out if this is more of a religious book or maybe a cultural or a political book at the time about a hundred years after Jesus, but it seems like, um, I say that because of all the references to Rome, but it seems like the, the biblical literature during Christ's time wasn't all that mad at the Romans. They didn't wish they were there, but they weren't peace persecuting the Jews, so each right. one allowed the other to exist benignly, sort of, but then it all fell apart about 50, 30 or 40 or 50 years later, yeah. And um, hence the, the reason for a book like Revelation. Does that sound correct? Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. Because all of a sudden, now remember, in the minds of the early Christians, they were going to all see Jesus return, mm-hmm. right? When you look at those passages, like the end of John's gospel, this picture like, hey, you know, you guys will be here for this. And so everyone, in, and even in, in Acts, right, the same way you saw him go, you're going to see him come back. So as people start dying off, they're thinking they missed it, like something happened, and which is what 1 Thessalonians is all about. A lot of that book is like trying to put people at ease. You didn't miss it. And those who died before he returned, they're just asleep. But now as you you get in parts of the empire, full on persecution of Christians that is executing them, there was a sense like this victory story that we've been told this might not be coming to pass. Like, like every other messianic, um, every, every person who claimed to be the Messiah and everyone got excited around, in the end, they got crushed. And then people just moved on like, well, I guess that wasn't the one. Well, because of Jesus resurrecting and all this stuff in the ascension, they thought, no, no, this is it. This is bringing God's kingdom. But remember, what, what they asked Jesus right before he ascended is, hey, now are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel, right? Like, this is the way the story goes. We get power now. 
And then he says, it's not for you to know the times and seasons. And then he takes off and then there's the two angels there. But they're thinking at some point, this kingdom is going to come together and we win. And so as it's getting bleaker and bleaker and Rome is getting stronger and stronger, they're like, this, this is another imposter. This doesn't turn out. And it's to say, nope, if you look at the big picture, the grand scheme, nothing's changed. This is playing out as was always expected to be. And Rome's going to get theirs in the end. But yeah, it does have a much more political feel on that level than any of the New Testament books. Because most New Testament books, when it comes to Rome and the authority, is live and let live. Right. Render unto Caesar. Yep, that's right. That's right. And in, and in Romans, right? Like, the state should get to control the sword, so don't mess with it. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, the good news is the book ends with good news. <laughs> we, we don't, I don't want you to, you know, worry, this might not turn out. It turns out really, really well. But going through it like this carefully, when we get to the end, some of the things that just become cliched things that we think about, it's going to make a different level of sense. So we'll finish up the book the next couple of weeks, and then we will think about the way different Christians that you might know might start talking about the end of the world and you don't even know what they're talking about. I will try to give you the primer to be able to talk left behind books with people. <laughs> How's that sound? Uh. <laughs> Somebody say, oh, okay. <laughs> do I have to, do I have to, I think I gave all mine away. I'm going to have to dig them out. Do I, I don't have to read them again, do I? No. <laughs> Maybe oh, when this is all over, we can get together in the sanctuary, make popcorn, and we'll watch the whole series. How many are oh. you no. with three of them? No. no. <laughs> I, I will say this. This will be just the one teaser, is that there is a strong in, – in this fits Luther, too, and Calvin. There's a strong anti-papacy view uh, in those books and movies – which isn't out of nowhere, right? Like the reformers said the same thing. When the reformers look at this Rome stuff, they're saying, yeah, the Roman Empire doesn't exist. This is talking about the papacy. The Pope was seen as the great whore of Babylon who was drinking the blood of the martyrs, right? And there's a lot of that in the Left Behind series. A lot of Catholic bashing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So. All right, let me pray for us to close, but it's great to see everyone. Does this work fine for everyone doing this yeah. Zoom style? Mm -hmm. And then if mm -hmm. you want to sleep in, you can still watch it later. <laughs> let me pray for us. God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that no matter what is happening in our world, you are king, you are Lord, you are in control. God, we pray that we see the things happening in our world for what they are that we don't be even like John, who when he sees the whore of Babylon, he's amazed and that we don't get seduced by the things of this age, the things that allure us, the things that society tells us are of greatest value. Help us to see your world through your eyes. And thank you for all these things, God. Keep us, I pray, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. It's great to see you all today. You guys Thank too. You. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. See ya. See ya. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.